Okay, good evening, everyone. I'd like to call the meeting to order. Secretary, will you lead us in the pledge? Oh, for those of you who need to know, the flag's back there. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All the world, please. Ruth Griffey? Here. Douglas Knight, here. Amanda Lee Milner? Here. Matthew Nelson? Here. David Ronecker? Do you not see him yet? Richard Sterner? Here. Corey Trussell? Here. Michael Wool? Here. Jennifer Zerfing? Here. Lisa Conrad? Here. John Defoe? Here. Here. Jennifer Ely? Here. John Fox? Here. Mark Herb? Shane Hotchkiss? Here. Wade Hunt? Here. Dana Myers? Here. Justin Parrott? Here. Ethan Sense? Here. Okay. I'd like to welcome all of our guests to the meeting this evening. Okay, thank you. Uh, moving on, we have uh, approval of minutes. Uh, there are none tonight. Financial reports, none. Hearing of scheduled delegations or individuals, none. Uh, public comment. Okay, just a reminder, uh, keep your comments to five minutes. Um, I'll start a little timer on, the, on my phone and when you hear the, that lovely radar sound from my phone, that means your, your time has expired. So thank you. And I'll give you a one minute warning. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Kelly Dia. Um, and I have three boys here in the high school, as you know. Um, I wanted to present some facts to you, represent some facts to you tonight. And then I have some questions for you. Studies are showing that failure rates for this year are beyond anything they've ever been with our students. As the survey um, shows that you sent out several months ago, the majority of our students want to be back in school full-time five days a week. Our suicide rates in our adolescent population along with depression and anxiety have significantly increased since the beginning of COVID. I was recently to my pediatrician for one of my son's well child checks and she told me that they're handing out antidepressants like candy. My pediatrician doesn't understand why kids are not in school full-time and she noted that high school kids, while they may develop COVID have flu-like symptoms. Our middle schoolers and elementary school kids and younger children are asymptomatic or have even milder symptoms. Hundreds to thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people die in this country every year from various illnesses, cancer, diabetes, heart disease, kidney failure, and the list could go on forever. Tens of thousands die from the flu every year, including children. They have, there have been few deaths in adolescent population due to COVID, and when we are seeing deaths in children, it is because they have multiple comorbidities or medical problems. Studies have been showing and continue to show that COVID is not typically spread in schools. The CDC and the WHO have been recommending for months to get our kids back in school full-time face-to-face, learning because that is what is best for them. Our extended care facilities and nursing homes are routinely testing the residents at least once a week. And if a resident tests positive today and they test them again in a week and they still test positive because they will test positive for at least 60 to 90 days from their initial onset of symptoms. These cases are being counted two and three times, if not more, because one person tested each time adds another positive case. So if that single person is tested five times, we are adding five positive cases when that is not true. COVID can be severe and cause death, but as we've noticed in the last 12 plus month, that is in the minority of our population. We have all of these facts and scientific evidence. And you can say that for every study that says something positive, there's a study that says something negative. Ultimately, I guess I have two questions for the board. You're all focusing on the deaths and the positive cases, which are inflated and not completely factual, but you are choosing to ignore the other facts that are negatively affecting our children. Why? Secondly, I have read the attestation and it heavily focuses on face coverings and also attempted mitigation efforts of six feet apart if possible. And studies are even showing that three feet in school classrooms are sufficient. 
you at the school board also have the ability to interpret the attestation as you will, which means you have the ability to send our children back to school, like hundreds of other districts in Pennsylvania and thousands across the country and across the world have resumed face-to-face -face time learning for all grade levels. Why are you choosing to have our children suffer to fall behind in their classes, to suffer psychologically, emotionally, and financially? Thank you. Hello, Open Reading Spring School Board. My name is Jen Goldhan. I'm sure that comes as no surprise at this point. I uh, just have a few quick statistics as far as which school districts are open around us for their high school students. Southwest School District tonight, their school board meeting, they will be voting, not talking about, not thinking about, not discussing, but actually voting to open their six through 12 grades. Central Dolphin High School, for those who don't know, that is the Harrisburg area. High schools are open four days a week. Two weeks ago, two weeks ago, Dover High School has been five days in person since September and have only had to close twice, once in October, once in late January for a few days in the one building only. Central Bucks County School District has been open for five days, all three of their high schools. This is a more populated area than us. They were in the red zone longer than us. Their school district has been open. Council Rock, also in Bucks County, the same area. They've been open five days a week for two weeks. We are not moving, we are not moving. And I really feel that this board is not getting our kids back to school in the high school timely enough. Our seniors are running out of time. Both Bucks County, as I mentioned, school districts, as well as Council Rock, they're in a higher populated area. They have signed the same attestation that this school district attestation has signed. It's a statewide general attestation. Plain and simple, open the school, open the high school, open it next week. We're done waiting. Get our kids back. Get them back now. Thank you. Hi, school board. My name is Stephanie Haley. Thanks for the time to speak. Um, so I'm here to advocate for my two high schoolers. Um, I have a ninth grader and 11th grader. My seventh grader is already back. Um, and the girls love when he's going back and they're not. Um, but I'm advocating for my two high schoolers because they're the ones in school. And that's all I can do is advocate for them. They're the students. Um, my kids are not any more important than anyone else's kids. I'm a parent. I'm not a scientist. I'm not a healthcare worker. I'm certainly not a teacher. Um, I'm a parent. Remedian's given us a lot, I feel, as parents, a lot of options to do to make this year manageable. Um, we would all prefer to have been in school every day without masks all year. That's what everyone would want, of course. That's not what we're experiencing. So I also am very aware that this hybrid schedule has not affected my family. My husband and I always work from home. So this hasn't had any adverse effect on that. I'm very aware that there are other families that do not have those luxuries. I'm also very aware that my kids are doing just fine. No one is depressed. No one's having any issues. Um, they're doing their thing. I have one daughter that's excelling and getting A's and one that you know has a couple classes and that's not the school's problem, that's my problem. Um, so I understand that there are families that are really have had to juggle this year. And when I asked the girls uh, what they wanted to do, because they're the ones in school, they're the ones wearing masks three days a week. Um, I said, if you can give me reasons why you want me to speak tonight for you, I'll do that. But the reason can't be because I like to watch The Office on Tuesday and Thursday, right? Mm -hmm. So their answers were really simple. Um, this schedule is something that they finally have under control. Um, they've been doing it since September. Uh, the 11th grader, you know, she should be able to manage her 
schedule. So this isn't something that is um, adversely affecting her, like I said. Um, they're thriving, they're in a routine, putting them back into disrupting their current routine to get them back into school. It's sort of like when they, you know, all of a sudden weren't in school last March. Um, they're not gonna be adversely affected if they go back. If the school board makes the decision that the kids are going back, they're gonna be just fine, but the preference is not to, and it's for their, their routine being disrupted. They finally understand what all the teachers, where everybody's putting all of their work. Um, so that's the reason. Um, you know, my ask is that all of the um, kids are taken into consideration. I'm hoping that the decision is made on facts and student feedback, because they're the ones uh, that are in school. Um, my daughters don't necessarily want to be in school five days with masks. They know the kids that sort of are pushing the limits right now. And to have them in closer proximity and bigger classrooms um, makes them a little uncomfortable. They will deal with it, okay? Um, because that's what I'm telling them. We're gonna all doing the best we can. Um, but I do hope that you'll take the student's perspective into account. Like I said, my kids are not more important than anyone else's kids here. Um, but their voice does matter. I'm not a teacher. I don't have to be in school with the kids all day long, like the teachers do. But I do feel like the student's voice is really important um, because they're the ones doing the work, trying to get the grades, trying to make it work. And um, I appreciate the options that you've given parents to this point. Uh, I really do appreciate that. So thank you for the time. Hi, my name is Molly Karam. I'm the freshman class president, and I'm here to give you insight on a high school student's perspective of the school year. Because of my role as class president, I have taken it upon myself to listen to my fellow classmates on their likes and dislikes about the current schedules and rules we have in place. From this, I have concluded that most people in my classes like and are comfortable with the hybrid schedule. And although this is a small portion of my class, I believe that it's important to note. Peers in my class have said things to me such as, I like to work at my own pace when at home, I like having smaller classes to talk to teachers, and I feel safer with less kids in school. Personally, I am proud of how Bermudian Springs is handling this pandemic with a hybrid schedule. Going hybrid has taught me, taught me skills such as time management, scheduling, self-resilience, and studying habits that I can carry into my college career. While having these conversations in school, I've had many teachers tell me that adults and people who make the rules don't know what we're thinking. So I'm here to propose an idea. I believe that the best way to truly understand what stress the student body are in is to conduct a school-wide survey for all high school students. And when conducting this survey, questions like, do you like hybrid, should be replaced with questions such as, do you feel, do you feel safer in a hybrid schedule? Is the hybrid schedule manageable? Is school stressful? And how, if so, how can we help? Other topics addressed in the survey can include social distancing and spring break concerns. These questions can help a bet, get a better understanding of student situations. At the end of the day, the students are the ones that are going to be most affected by the schedule changes, not the parents. We must listen to the students of Remedian Springs to ensure a safe end to the school year. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Nathan Biles, and I'll try to keep this short. I have uh, four children. Two of them are in the elementary school and one in the middle school. I have a particularly feisty three-year-old at home as well. Uh, for the past several years, I've been a substitute at Bermudian. I pick up positions around my wife's schedule. Um, she works on call at a hospital, and uh, it's been extra busy for her this year, so I haven't been able to pick up as many positions as I would have liked. But um, my subbing has mostly been in the elementary, uh, though I have done a couple of days in the middle as well. I've also spent the last six years helping with Lake Mead Playgroup, which sadly has been unable to run this year. Um, 
I've felt inclined to speak at one of these meetings in the past because I'd like to share my perspective as a parent and as well as someone who has spent a fair amount of time in our schools and with children. My purpose in speaking tonight is to just share my perspective and recognize what people do for our community and for, to recognize what people do for our children and community. This past year has been a challenging year to say the least. I was subbing the last day we had in-person learning last year, and back then we thought we'd be out for just two weeks. The year since has been a journey that continues today. In the past year, so many businesses, schools, churches, and communities have been put in positions to plan and make difficult decisions with rules and medical advice that were constantly changing. I'm sure everyone in this room can relate to spending time formulating a plan with the information we currently have. And just when you think you're ready to implement that new plan, new information comes in, comes out and throws that whole plan for a loop. I've listened to some of these board meetings as well as I've had discussions with teachers, parents, and some of the board members. And I wanted to come here tonight just to say that I appreciate what you're doing. I recognize that everyone here is here because they care about our children and our community. I don't agree with every decision that has been made. And to be honest, I don't think there could have been an option that would have had me excited to really move forward with, but that's just the nature of making difficult decisions. And I just wanted to say thank you for what you do here. I'd also like to speak for a minute about my perspective as a substitute. Something I've learned over the past few years as a sub preschool teacher and parent is just how important it is to create an environment that is conducive to learning for learning to really happen. While a lot goes into creating this, the main thing, in my opinion, is the teacher. They set the tone for the day with their attitude. This year has been particularly challenging for teachers as well. But every time I sub in our buildings, I'm truly impressed with how our teachers respond to the difficult circumstances. Our school is an amazing place, and it runs because of some amazing people. I'm so grateful for our teachers, aides, and staff that make our school what it is for our children. Thank you all for what you do. One of my favorite things as a sub is to substitute in the class at the beginning and at the end of the year. Kindergarten is particularly enjoyable for this. The progress amazes me with what they learn as well as the relationships they form over the year. This year has been no exception to that experience. The kids still love being here and a lot of the questions or concerns I had leading into this year ended up working out just fine. In these challenging times, I find it important to recognize the efforts of our teachers and staff and the members of the board here that take every day, or <clears throat> I'd just like to recognize what they do every day to keep our kids and community safe. Thank you all for all that you do. My name is Mandy Geringer, and I, I have uh, two kids at the high school, one at the middle school. I wanted to start off by thanking all of you for everything you do. My dad was a school board president when I was in school, my grandfather before him. It's not an easy job. I've heard the stories growing up. Thank you for everything you do. You can never make everybody happy. I appreciate all the work that you put in. So. My plan was to just talk, but I'm glad I wrote it down. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm here tonight to speak on behalf of a lot of people that can't be here. They're nervous to speak in front of everyone. Um, I, I've heard from a lot of different people in my spot. Um, my children are not different from anyone else's. They're not better. Everybody has different circumstances. But my three kids really are thriving in hybrid. They were in distinguished honors before. They are in distinguished honors now. They're working hard. Everyone has different, different sets of problems. But I'm I just want to let you know that I guess it, the hybrid isn't bad for everyone. In the high school, there's a lot of um, project-based learning. 
when you have hybrid, then you have time to work on your projects. They're smaller classes. So they have time with their teachers and then they have time to go home and work. I am, they, teenagers um, have different sleep patterns. They're able to pick their own schedule during the day. I think that's really important to let them do that. When you go from six hours a day, seven hours a day in school and all of a sudden you're in college, you don't know how to, to work your day. So I think that's an important skill. I am concerned for the teacher's health for bringing back the high school too fast. I am concerned about the cafeteria. I don't know how that could be healthy. I'm, I'm worried about a lot of things. It doesn't just affect the kids, it, it affects the kids on the bus. So then it affects all the other schools. All I'm asking is if you would just I guess slow down and just let's see what happens with the elementary school and the middle school. They were just in Monday for the middle school. Let's see what happens. Let's be safe. Thank you for everything you do. Thank you. Stand. <laughs> so my first school board meeting, my name's Chris Young. Um, I'm a parent of two people or two boys that go to the district here, go to the school. Uh, I'm a pretty involved parent. I'm the president of the sports club for the high school. Uh, I know many of the people in here uh, know and respect all of them. Um, so what I'm here to say is, 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 is not geared towards any kind of disrespect. Uh, in any way, shape, or form. These parents are advocating uh, on their students' behalf. There's nothing more noble than that, uh, and I, I respect it. That said, I know just following the school board meetings over the course of the last year that there's a, a, a faction of parents that really want their kids back, and I understand that. Nobody wants this. Nobody really wants to deal with this. But to assume for a minute for the school board to assume for a minute that that is maybe the majority simply because that has been maybe the most vocal group, I think would be a fallacy. I don't think it's the majority. Maybe it's split 50-50, maybe it's not. But I, what I can tell you is being an involved parent and being involved with the high school on a lot of levels for a lot of years, I can tell you one thing for sure. The vast majority of students that I have talked to have unequivocally said that they prefer the hybrid model in this time frame. Now, in normal times, no, they probably wouldn't, and I get that. The fact also remains that simply because we want them to go back to being face-to-face -face every day, and we want them to be able to do that in a safe way, doesn't mean that we are not courting a disaster logistically, especially at the high school level. Now, I'm not saying that it's destined to be a disaster, but I can tell you high school is different from elementary and it's different from the middle school. This is a transient population of students. Many of them work, many of them drive, and many of them have broad social circles that their parents don't even exactly know how to gauge, okay? We're not talking about elementary kids whose parents are able to watch them most of the day and know exactly where they were and whose house they were at. We're talking about high school students that are fairly independent. Some of them might work at rudders. They might work in town. They work at places where they are exposed in different ways than the other populations of this district. By dissolving the hybrid model, one of the things that I think could definitely happen is that you are going to see a strain put on the administration, the teachers, and most in particular, the students. These students started off a year like no other students have. And we can all agree, I think, that September was a rocky month. Maybe even the first marking period was a rocky marking period. There
There's no doubt about that. Change is painful. And this change was thrust upon us. But one thing that I do know, just from paying attention to this, the change to an electronic platform for their major learning was destined to happen. The pandemic sped it up. I've heard a lot of parents complaining about Canvas, complaining about that that's you know, keeping their kids from being able to learn. I understand that it's difficult. It was difficult for me. But one thing I can say about Canvas and, uh, is that it's here to stay, some form of it. Uh, when you go to college, it's going to be there too. So we can't blame simply that because right now, if you talk to a lot of the students, those problems have been kind of ironed out. They, there's still hiccups, there definitely are, but those are gonna happen no matter what. The fact of the matter is, the kids going back is going to ultimately allow all of them to be here with the, with the teachers, with the administration. Now, I don't know about you, but I want my administration, I want my teachers safe, and I want them working on the things that the kids need. I don't want them working on simply running around, trying to be socially distant and enforcing masks every day of the week. Because let's be honest, everybody in here is going to make that nearly impossible. So I ask you to please remember, when you make your deliberations and you make your decision, understand that these people that are advocating on their children's behalf, it's very respectful but it does not necessarily represent the majority. They have a point, I don't disregard it. But there are a lot of children that have been successful at this model and children are resilient and they adapt. And these kids have. All right. Um, my name is Jennifer Karam. I'm Molly's mom. So she's a, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, my name is Jennifer Karam. I'm Molly Karam's mom. She's a freshman. I wasn't planning on speaking tonight, but I'm inspired by all these people here. So I'm just going to put my two cents in and advocate for my child. I'm all for staying hybrid. I work in the medical field. I personally have lost three family members to COVID. Um, it's scary to me. My daughter, I enforce masks all the time, hand sanitizing, social distancing. I don't think we can do that if we're all day, everybody's here all day. I just don't know how the cafeteria, they take off their masks to eat. I don't know how that's going to work. Um, high school, there's a lot of switching of classes as well. Not so much eighth and under, but high school, you do switch those classes in the hallways. Are people wearing their masks? Are people touching each other? Um, what about the desks? Are they being cleaned? I, I just worry. Um, and I was vaccinated and I feel a, a relief on me, but these teachers aren't. Some of them are maybe, some of them had COVID, I don't know, but I worry about them too with all these children. I have a college age son, he comes back. What is he bringing home? Like he's not vaccinated. I'm sure there's lots of other college kids coming back home in the families and then these kids are coming back here. What about spring break? Is that gonna be a super spreader two weeks from then? Are we gonna have to shut down? Perhaps we should just finish this year out the way it is. And hopefully next year we can all start where we were, you know, five days a week. Um, hopefully with the vaccine and all, we can go back to some normalcy. But I tell you what, my daughter has learned so much from the hybrid model. She has time management under her belt now. She, I mean, who doesn't want to stay up and watch TV all night if you're only going to school two days a week? But she forces herself to go to bed at 11. She gets up on time, even on the days she isn't going to school. They're resilient. They are going to remember these, these life lessons in their college career. My son could have used a dose of that, actually. So I, I do think staying hybrid might be just the way to go and stay 
till the end of the year. Um, there's really only a semester and a half. And my daughter's thriving. I'm an involved parent. Um, I fear for the teachers and the administration. I just, I wanna be an advocate for my child. So I just thought I'd speak. All right, so my name's Keith Dia, and my kids are having the opposite effect. So, um, and the one question I do have for you is that um, a lot of the principals had said, I think it was last week or, or last meeting, that the kids are on schedule for where they're supposed to be educationally. Um, and I do have a question how they can do that when they're only in school for a half of the, half of the time. Now, granted, they are working at home, that other half of the time. Um, I have two juniors and in that half of the time, those Tuesdays and Thursdays that they are off of school, they work for maybe an hour and that's it. So I don't know how that hour translates into a full school day's worth of work. Um, that's great if it's really that, but um, somehow I don't think that's how it's happening. And the other one is a ninth grader and it is just project based and he is not a project learner. And it, it's it's a struggle all the time with him. So um, what should take him an hour will take him eight hours. And that's because I'm trying to teach him. If it was a teacher, teacher would be able to get it done in 15 minutes, but it, he just does not listen to me. Um, I did have another point. I'm trying to remember what she wrote it down. Um, um, now I know a lot of the teachers are scared to say what they really feel because they will literally tell the, the students, um, they say they are way behind. They're not where they're supposed to be. They don't know how they're gonna get everything they're supposed to get in by the end of the year. Um, I have juniors, you know, they're, they're looking at colleges. Look, Roanoke College, not going there, but we were just doing college visits. Um, you know, how's that gonna affect them going forward? This is their critical time in junior, senior year. Probably junior is the most important year for them. And they are getting royally, <laughs> um, whatever. But, you know, it is what it is. Um, but, yeah, they really prefer. I, opposite of Chris, I, I work with Boy Scouts. I talk to a majority of the Boy Scouts. I have yet to hear a single one say they love the hybrid model, you know. Um, the teachers, they say, the teachers that I've talked to said they don't like the hybrid model. They want face-to-face -face learning. Um, and a couple of them said, if they don't go to face-to-face -face learning, they will be looking for new jobs next year. And that's a shame because I really like some of these teachers. They are great teachers. Uh, thank you. Um, my name is Greta Haley. I'm a freshman. Um, I'm going to talk about the at-home days. Um, the at-home days, I wake up at 8, 30, 9 o'clock every day, which gets me more motivated to do schoolwork because I have more time to sleep. Um, I don't go to bed at midnight, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock. I go to bed at 10, 30, 11 o'clock every night, so it's not like I'm not getting enough sleep. I get plenty of sleep, um, but the more sleep I get, the more motivated I am to do schoolwork. Um, I get up, I do my attendance. I actually have time to eat breakfast, which then helps me get motivated. Um, I do at least eight hours of schoolwork, um, even more, which is my decision. It's not on the teachers. It's my choice to do more schoolwork than I'm asked to. My teachers give me everything I need the day before. I have everything I need. If I need to contact them, I use email. They are always open to do Zoom links. Um, they are very helpful in my learning. And um, I really like the hybrid schedule because it works for me. Um, um, and if we go back, I will adapt to it but I would rather say hybrid because I've gotten used to it. Um, so that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Uh, 
Okay, thank you everyone for your, for your comments. Okay, we will move on to new business in the agenda. Uh, we have some personnel items, uh, employment of some support staff. I move to approve one A and B. Second. I have a motion and a second, any further discussion? This is a roll call vote. All those members in attendance will be recorded voting in favor of the motion unless I hear a nay or abstain. Motion carries. We have an addition to our support staff substitute listing. Motion to approve. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item three, uh, rescinding of an extracurricular contract. Motion to approve. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item four, two extracurricular contracts. Move to approve four A and B. Second. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? This is a roll call vote. All those members in attendance will be recorded voting in favor of the motion unless I hear a nay or abstain. Motion carries. Item five, a volunteer assistant. Move to approve. Second. A motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item B, disposal of equipment. Motion to approve. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item C, Kutztown University Student Internship Agreement. Motion to approve. Second. A motion and a second. Any further discussion? Mr. Wall, I have a question. <laughs> Can Dr. Hotchkiss explain a little bit more about this program to us? Absolutely, we can. Um, this is actually, thank you. This is actually um, in reference to accepting interns uh, from Kutztown University in their programs. It's uh, in alignment to board policy 407 that says any future um, agreements with universities need to be board approved. So to our knowledge, we haven't had any um, interns from Kutztown University or student teachers from Kutztown University in the past. And this allows us uh, to enter into any agreement with student teachers or interns. Any other discussion? This is a roll call vote. All those members in attendance will be recorded voting in favor of the motion, unless I hear a nay or abstain. Motion carries. Okay, moving on to other business. Um, we have item A. First will be a discussion around the K-8 student return. Yes, uh, last meeting, um, you, uh, we had decided to have this meeting to get an update. Uh, with the return of students. And so last week we brought back K to two, five and six that was impacted by the weather, um, crazy week, weather week. Um, and of course this week uh, as well with um, Monday was the first day that we've had all students back K through eight. And so tonight remotely, we have Mrs. Ely from the elementary school, Mrs. Myers uh, from the middle school. And I've asked them to just um, share how it's going. Um, and the other piece that, that I want to start out with, and I, and I did say, um, you know, we're only looking at 72 hours, so we have to keep that in mind. And so for me, the most important thing is, is our plan working, the flow, the schedule, lunches, all of the logistical things that look good on paper, and then you have bodies come in that are impacted. So I'd like them to talk about that. I'd also um, have them share 
um, words of wisdom, something they experienced for the benefit of, of Mr. Defoe with the high school um, and what that looks like, knowing that each building is a, is a little bit different. So I am going to turn it over and I'm gonna put my speaker up as loud as I can to hear from Mrs. Ely. So Mrs. Ely, you have the floor. All right, good evening. Um, just like Dr. Hotchkiss said, it's really been five days um, since we've kind of started this full return. Last week we had kindergarten through second grade back in the building for two days. Um, and then today we finished our third day with all students back in the building. The feel of the building has definitely been that of excitement. Um, the students love being back together, which is a positive. Overall, I would say just the pre-planning was really critical. Mr. Sense and I worked very closely with the staff, the custodial maintenance teams, just to ensure a smooth and safe transition back into the building. Um, we prioritized all students eating at least six feet apart within classrooms and the cafeteria. So this involved the removal of most of the furniture of classrooms beyond desks and guided reading tables. In addition, we worked with all teachers to determine desk spacing and mark desk locations within classrooms with sticker dots to ensure the maximum space between desks throughout the day um, for instruction. We also worked with most of our teachers to identify other areas in the room where stu students could go to create distance of six feet to safely take class mask breaks. Other teachers have elected to assign designated spots around the room for snack and mask breaks and are having these opportunities one group at a time during center rotations. We had several opportunities, um, both electronically and in person to answer questions that the staff had as we planned for the full return. We also met in person to brainstorm solutions as a building to ensure that staff and students remained as safe as possible with the full return. But overall, I would just say that we are very pleased with the first five days of our full return. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Mrs. Ely, at least right now? Okay, Mrs. Myers. Hi, uh, Mrs. Myers. I uh, definitely don't want to repeat many of the same things that Mrs. Ely just shared, but we essentially took the same approach to planning. Um, as far as meeting with teachers, um, discussing, you know, the custodial and maintenance crews were amazing at making sure that we had the furniture that we needed to accommodate class sizes. We um, are not as fortunate as far as the cafeteria is concerned at the middle school. Um, we are able to maintain about four feet um, with all students facing the same direction, utilizing both the auxiliary and um, cafeteria spaces. We have uh, utilized that opportunity for our seventh and eighth graders, um, allowed them the chance to select a, a friend or two to sit with um, just because they are with the same kids all day long. And so felt like this was at least one opportunity using assigned seats that we would be able to provide them that and probably will be able to do that with fifth and sixth in the near future as well. Um, the teachers have been fantastic um, as far as, you know, maintaining cleaning and um, adjusting just schedules so that we have traffic flow in the hallways and walking students and trying to uh, maintain that uh, right side of the hallway so that there's not a ton of uh, cross traffic. From a structural and a scheduling standpoint, I you know have nothing but positive things to say. It's definitely been refreshing to hear the, the buildings full of noise, the, the hallways full of noise. Again, um, hearing that even from the ladies in the front office is, is certainly a positive thing. Um, as far as just words of wisdom. And so this, this definitely comes, you know, it's only as Mrs. Yealy and as you know, we all know, it's only been a couple of days. Um, it's definitely like the first day of school all over again for many of our students. And so the first day, full day back, for groups of students, there was a lot of excitement and, you know, took some time to get reacclimated and um, really kind of see the other cohort for the first time for a full year in many cases. So uh, I will say what I want to share tonight that I think is just important and kind of echoes many of the, the things that you've heard tonight what we've dealt with in the last couple of days um, with our students is that while some are super excited to be back five days a week, we, we have had more struggles in the last three days, um, behaviorally, emotionally, um, and just overall expressive 
emotions from students sharing about how overwhelming this is. Um, you know, and, and we've done a lot as a staff to really talk about how we can best support students in this transition. Um, you know, I know it's a small thing, but one thing that I requested uh, five through eight was that we are at this point not assigning any homework to students. Again, I know that probably sounds like a small thing, but the reality is, is that adjusting from two to two and a half days to a full five day is not just tough for adults. And it's, it's, you know, probably twice as hard for the, the little ones to, to do that. And so we really want the at home piece to kind of be time for kids to decompress and not think about school for now. Um, we may shift that you know, as we feel like things are, our students are adjusting and getting back into the swing of things. But as far as words of wisdom, um, I'm already working with Mrs. Umball. I think especially with our seventh and eighth graders, we really need to take a look at the anxiety, that overwhelming, that sense of over uh, where they're feeling really overwhelmed just with the change. Um, Mrs. Umball is reaching out to some other middle school counselors to just gather some information to educate teachers or re-educate teachers just about signs of anxiety, how to de-escalate situations or um, avoid escalating, you know, a further situation by really you know, uncovering what it is that's going on um, in a student's mind that oftentimes if you ask five through eight, or even, you know, the little kids, um, what's wrong, they can articulate it right now. But I, the last two days, we've had several, I'd say specifically seventh and eighth graders share how difficult this transition back is for them. And so I think that that is just a word of caution to the high school, um, something to be super mindful of. And I think to pay close attention to as the weeks progress, um, as far as cases and, and quarantines, we're at our lowest, but I also think that, uh, the true test will be in the next uh, two weeks or so, if there's really an impact overall on the building. Um, but over, you know, again, overall pleased and, and happy to have the kids back. I just think that we have, you know, a new layer of, of challenges that, that we're going to really need to pay close attention to, and we're prepared to do the best we can with it and hope that things continue to um, look positive. Mrs. Myers, unlike at the elementary school with dismissal, we dismiss a few buses at a time at the elementary school, so it's very much controlled. What, what have you done differently with dismissal at the end of the day with all of the kids' hallways and buses? What does that look like now? Can you talk about that? I can. We actually um, are dismissing very similarly to the elementary school right now. So we call about three buses at a time. And once those kids appear to the majority of them have exited Mrs. the building. Mrs. Myers, did you hear my question? Yes. Okay. Can you hear me? Oh, now we got you. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, we've adjusted dismissal to be very similar to the elementary building. So we're only calling three buses at a time. And once we feel like the majority of the students have exited uh, for those first three buses, we just call the next three. So we're just calling them in, sh in small waves. Thank you. All right, I am going to stop my share and Mr. Defoe um, is going to share a few slides with you just about some of the planning that, that has taken place and, and thoughts. And, and actually um, this is one of those areas that we'll be able to explain to you um, a little bit about what that would look like with students back. So Mr. Defoe, I'm gonna stop and then give it to you. I just share with share the with folks. folks. <laughs> Good evening. Can you hear me? Good evening. Good evening. 
John DeFober, Media and Springs High School, um, here to talk about uh, a high school return and, and what would be the ramifications and, and the things that would be adjusted and necessary. So at, at our last meeting, I think there was a bit of a misconception that there's not been conversations and plans. I mean, inevitably, whether it's at some point this year or in the future, there's going to be a return. So we've had uh, numerous conversations about this and and have, and have uh, you know, had conversations about a planning process moving forward. So the first thing is in the high school in the morning, we serve breakfast every day. And, and I'm gonna use the word normal. When I say normal, it's before March 13th of 2020, if you will. Um, at that point in time, when students either got off the bus or drove in here, they could come to this cafeteria, go through at their own pace, get breakfast and sit anywhere in the cafeteria um, with a return and and because of mitigations we we would change and i've spoken to mrs sterling already we'd change the breakfast program to a grab and go so you would come in you'd grab whatever it was you'd want for breakfast and go directly to your home room and and the biggest component to that is the no gathering or hanging out uh, no matter how much we talk about mitigations, and I think Mrs. Myers touched on it a little bit, it's a daily challenge to prevent old habits and the social aspect of school for sure. The hallways, um, as you walked in this evening, you, you've, you, if you took notice, there are red dots about every five, six feet. Down the center of the hallway is best and as straight as possible. That was not done with a chalk line like a construction person would do it. It was, it was, it was just so. There's a couple that are crooked. I get that, but uh, the point is, we we wouldn't change to one direction. I, I've had numerous uh, conversations um, with different schools and that are in different settings. Uh, we would we would stay with our same uh, pattern, and and I think the the mindset with that is the less amount of time you spend in the hallway and the quicker that you can get to the next location, the better. So uh, to that point, if I were in the cafeteria and I'm going there and the direction makes me go right, it makes no sense to walk the whole high school to come back to the, to the same area. Um, again, the, the, the big component here, we do that is we gotta stay to the far right. Uh, that's the purpose of the, of the dots in the center. Um, and and we'd, we'd, need to, we'd need to make a significant adjustment to, to moving about in single file setting from one location to the next, um, just because of the increased numbers. Classrooms, uh, desks will be separated, obviously to the fullest extent possible. We've heard that term uh, numerous times throughout this whole process in many classrooms, there six feet will be possible. And when I say a classroom, I think the difference uh, in a high school setting is I have seven instructional periods a day, six feet may be possible in five of those seven and the other two, it won't be. Uh, it's not, they're gonna be the same for an individual teacher or room 225 all day long. It's gonna vary depending on the class and, and, and number of students. Uh, we do have classrooms, especially in our science wing with the granite or, or uh, hard top tables. Um, so they're not desk we're working on and, and we've currently put bids out to get quotes on something similar to this. Uh, this was a man made idea that we came up with in the return of this year because of the face to face component here in the cafeteria. Um, I won't speak for the students, but they're not real crazy about it. I will tell you that for sure. <laughs> um, with the with our current enrollment uh, in the high school and our current class rosters as they are, there'd be 30 class periods with more than 18 students. So 18 is kind of that, I mean, most of the classrooms across the district are pretty similar in size. There's some that are a little bigger and smaller than others, uh, but 18 was kind of that, that number that when you got past that six feet became, uh, became not possible. Again, social distancing would be to the maximum extent possible. Uh, what I will say is of those 30, 10 of those are health classes. And we, the way the health is structured and built around PE, we offer more PE sections than health. If we flip that, we would have PE classes of 40 or 50 kids. So um, the, one of the changes we made from the beginning this year is health and, and PE have both been held in the gymnasiums, both gymnasiums, and that would continue um, if, if we move forward. 
Uh, health and PE, right now our largest section in PE would be 27 under our current enrollment uh, configuration. Um, and like I said in previous slide, 10 of the health classes have 18 or more students, some with upwards of 25. Uh, on average, about 22 students in a, in a health classroom. Um, health PE will require both spaces. So when we first started, and I'll get to the cafeteria later, uh, when we first started, that was one of the options was the auxiliary gym as a, as a secondary cafeteria space. Um, but it's gonna be absolutely necessary for the health and PE classes, especially at least until we get consistent better weather, um, you know, hopefully, hopefully in the not too distant future. Uh, and as I said, nicer weather will allow for some outside activities in not only PE, but possibly health as well. Study halls. Um, Mrs. Dove and I have sat down and had conversations and the, the study halls in a high school, if you've ever looked at a high school schedule, it is a little complicated at first. If you've had a freshman, it, it takes a little time to get used to because period four can have three different things and it can have upwards of six different things if you have a different semester course. So we have some kids that have a study hall all six cycle days, and then there are a myriad of other combinations, one and four, two and five, one, two, five. And I mean, there's a myriad of combinations there. So with that said, period eight, nine, which is one of our lunch shift periods, um, all six days, we'll have at least 90 students. And we currently house study hall in the LGI. So it's the large group instruction that's, that's tier stadium seated. Um, off the top of my head, I think it's 113 or 115 seats in there, and that's no empties. Um, we, we have to move out to the auditorium. Uh, I mean, there's, there's just no other option where they have to, would have to go to the auditorium. Um, you know, for lack of better terms, the auditorium's not ideal for a study hall. There's not desks and that, but, you know, it would be a necessary component. Um, other periods throughout the day, um, we, we feel like we could continue to keep them in the LGI. Some we'd be able to keep two seats in between and others would be one. Um, uh, cafeteria, right now, um, and, and we've had a conversation. If you look at uh, this, this divider, like I said, that was a, a man-made uh, idea. Um, the concept that we'd like to start with, um, and we've, we've reached out to several companies for uh, some quotes on what that would look like, but would be a four-way divider. So if, if you, the table I'm sitting at, we'd be, if this was a big pizza, half of it would be gone already probably if I was sitting here. But if this were a big pizza, we'd cut it into four, all right? And the concept that's different than this is we've measured this and we want those panels to be 60 inches if possible. So we want them to come to the edge. So if I'm within my two panels, and again, this, this is a daily challenge. I'm in my panel, my mask is off and I can eat. You can still talk through the panels. It's possible. A lot of students don't like that and this is what we do. Mm -hmm. Hey, how's it going today? What are you doing? Now we're on top of each other. So it's a daily challenge. So the, the concept would be to, we have 45 tables in here, our current capacity at 90. Um, at four to a table that would more than accommodate the lunches that we have. And we would, we would keep the four to a table um, to as minimal as possible. So that's what the next chart kind of shows. And five lunch, currently we'd have 149 if we brought everybody together. Uh, so we would have, um, all 45 tables would have three kids and 14 of those would have four kids sitting at it. Uh, for a reference point, there are 15 on each tier. So we have three, three distinct tiers to the cafeteria. There are 15 tables on each tier. Seven lunch is the largest at 161. So again, 45 tables at three and 26 would be at four. So uh, a full tier and a half. And then line, nine lunch, 147. So 45 with three to a table and then 12 at four. Uh, to, to Mrs. Myers' point, the easiest way to do that would be to just print a seating chart and let everybody know where your seat is um, and, and being mindful of, you know, the challenges and what school would look like. We, we would probably identify the first day what tables have for based on the lunch count. And once you pick a table, then that would become the assigned seat or assigned table moving forward. Um, that will be a challenge. It sounds simple, but th that certainly will be a challenge. Um, if that's not the plan or if that's not, um, 
you know, what everybody's comfortable with, with, you know, four to a table and 150 uh, in here at one time. And I, and I, I'd be remiss not to say we're fortunate that that lunch count, it, it's almost never that even. I mean, we've had years of 200 and 135, the way it shakes out. So it is a little more even than normal, fortunately. Um, the, the backup plan to that, if either A, the, you know, I mean, there's a cost to these dividers for sure. Um, the backup plan would be to stay at two to a table in here. And then all study halls would have to be moved to the auditorium over the lunch shifts. And in that room, we can get about 50 at every other seat. That would mirror the middle school. Um, you'd have an empty seat. You could, if you wanted, you could reach out and touch the next person for sure. You'd be three feet probably. You'd be facing the same direction. With that said, um, in, in, in two of the shifts, we'd still have a carryover if every kid was in school that day. And we'd have to have a third location uh, to house some of those students. And again, that would, after day one, we'd have to have seating charts to, to make that possible. The, the two ideas with that right now is we do have a classroom off of this. It's got computers and stuff. And then we have an old writing center right up the hallway here um, that, that would house those. Uh, we have two lunch aides. We, we're, we don't have a lot of aides in, in the building. So, um, you know, obviously we'd be involved in that process, but we could have kids in three different locations if everybody was here, if, if that would be the option. Uh, Mr. Carlson and Mr. Boyce, we've had conversations about band and music. They've both done an excellent job this year. Um, one of the reasons that we're here is, as you know, the, the, the musical is trying to record right now for the upcoming performances. So period three is the, the big challenge. Um, concert choir will have 40, concert band is 44. Um, I'm not going to try to fully explain this because it's a really difficult to understand, but we, we had a lot of conflicts with kids that want both. So what we did in scheduling creative, creatively a few years back is some only wanted one or the other, and they're there all six days. And the ones that we wanted both on the odd days, they get choir and on the even days they get course. So when Mr. Carlson has 40 or uh, 40, Mr. Boyce probably has like 26, 28, something like, so there's a fluctuation there. Um, obviously they're housed in these two rooms. And as they've done throughout the year, they just do a rotation from classroom to stage to auditorium to create spacing um, and, and the, the air exchange. Uh, from a from a set room it's I think the recommendation every 30 minutes there should be an air exchange that takes place so um, that's what that would look like dismissal uh, we, we'd have to stagger at the end of the day whether we did it by grade or, or by certain parts of the building um, I don't think we need to do three buses at a time at this level uh, the, the big difference for us is a lot of students drive and uh, one group's waiting you know, whether we hold one of them back or the others, ideally, um, if we get the car right, if we get the drivers out first, that'd be great, but we never know what that looks like from the buses. So, um, you know, to, to Mrs. Myers's point, they were getting over here like 244, then all the kids came back and it was 253 those first couple of days, and now we're back to approximately 250 uh, as they've gotten comfortable. Uh, but there'd have to be a stagger process. And again, just to prevent gathering and, and, and so forth. Um, you know, one of the concepts is, is increased days for identified students. And I know we've talked about this in the past and we've heard uh, uh, about the students that, that, are, that are having a difficult time academically. Um, I think one of, the, one of the things to clarify in, in the previous presentations is the numbers this year are almost identical to previous last year. So, um, we've heard that there's an, ex an extreme difference and, and so many kids are failing. The numbers, their numbers are very similar to what they've been previous years. And I'm not saying it's, it's okay or acceptable. Obviously, we'd, we'd all love them to be zero. Um, but at two plus courses, you'd add about 50 students a day. Uh, and if you went down to the one, you'd add an additional 22. Because obviously, they're, they're already here two days, so you're only adding them on the other day. That'd be about a 31% increase to the population in the building if, if we go that route. Uh, challenges, and, and this is by no means a all-encompassing list, um, but currently Eagles and Academy enrollment's 138. We had no idea what that looked like. The other buildings, last I had heard, 
had like two kids come in and three go out or vice versa. There wasn't a lot of movement. I, I make that point because if 50 or 60 kids would decide to return everything we just talked about to a much different, you know, we got to, we got to reboot, revamp that and take a look, especially as it relates to the cafeteria. Um, buses. Uh, Mrs. Meyer said it's definitely ramped up. I can I've been on two buses already this week at the end of the day. Uh, we're the last, we're the last stop. So if we get the calls like, Hey, can you get so-and-so or whatever? So I've been on two buses already. Um, good opportunity to introduce myself to middle future high schoolers. And, and, you know, we've, we've just talked about the mask and, and we've talked about it from the standpoint that this isn't about whether we like it or we don't like it. It's, it's a requirement. And, um, you know, it's, 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 it's a part where you, you get a lot less supervision. It's really difficult to drive a bus and do those things. And um, so it, it's definitely been an increase already. I mean, I've been on two buses and have had two or three phone calls with Mr. Herb already this week. So uh, challenges, obviously the, da uh, the daily mitigation with student movement and increased class sizes, you know, that's, that's obvious. Big difference from eight to 16 or 14 to 22 or whatever that may look like. There's just a huge difference uh, in that. Um, safety, obviously that's a concern. Um, students, staff and community. Um, a lot of people spoke tonight and have spoken from various viewpoints. Um, our viewpoint is, is, is you know, much larger and, it, and it's all encompassing. Um, and I don't, you know, I'm not a medical expert, but the, the air exchange component, the classrooms with eight kids as compared to 16 repetitively throughout the day, um, you know, that, that's obviously a concern. Uh, contact tracing and quarantining. Um, numbers right now have been good uh, through, I mean, we were, the, the predictions were the, the post Thanksgiving travel and Christmas, that went through the roof. I mean, that's all. I'll speak for myself. That's all. It seemed like that's all I did for the better part of a month and a half was contact tracing and making phone calls and and dealing with that. That is right now is as calm as it's been for sure. Um, obviously, I don't know what that looks like. I've had conversations with other high schools to uh, Mrs. Goldhan's point, and some have closed periodically. The one thing they've all said is when we have a case, 40, 60 kids go in quarantine. And they've had kids, the same kid, get quarantined three, four, five times in one school year. So, you know, to that point, it's a little bit of luck of the draw who you sit next to, how they're mitigating what they're doing. Um, that's uncontrollable. You know, uh, whether you, you're at work and you got a call that someone with pie, whatever that looks like, that, that, that's uncontrollable. Uh, across York County in conversations with those schools, one of the one of the things that really jumped out to me is their their masking um, expectation, if you will. Like we've been, uh, I know in high school we've not we've not disciplined one student about a mask. Okay, with that said, it is challenging if you speak to the same student five days in a row about wearing it properly. Like it, you start to feel like it's defiant, not not a mask issue. You know what I mean? But across them, the, 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 the provisions they've had is warning, suspension, removal to cyber. I don't think any of us desire or want that, but that's, that's what they've enacted. And to that point, I can't speak for what it looks like during the day. And, and at the end of the day, this comes back to a level of comfort, a level of risk that you're comfortable uh, in regards to that. But without question, you know, contact tracing would be significant to this point. Um, all the quarantines and everything that I've dealt with, um, there's only been once that there was contact tracing necessary from the school day and from a classroom. With a full return, there will be absolutely a ton of contact tracing with a positive and, and it can be totally out of anyone's control. And that's not a choice for us. It's not a matter of whether we think or not. That's a letter of the law. We follow what that looks like and we must bend and work through that process. The other piece of that that's been challenging is that can be 20 days for a student, right? I mean, there, there's a second component to that if it's a household situation and they can't be isolated. So uh, ultimately, you know, there, there, there's, there's a lot of lost time. It may not be everybody, but there, there's going to be students that lose more time in, in that setting. Um, 
And to that point, every period, you're going to have a different neighbor. You know, when you go from period one to period two, you're not a mod, you're not a pod, you're not a, you're not a cohort. You're going from geometry to chemistry or whatever that may be. You know, there, there's a difference there. And the last piece, and this is really, um, probably really only makes sense to people that have worked with a high school schedule or manipulated and, and Mr. Sterner kind of mentioned this at the last meeting, but when we start the scheduling process, which starts here in a week or two weeks, till we finish it in late July, August and give kids schedules, you're talking about a five, 600 hour process till you tease through all that. The big teasing to that is trying to balance. So that balancing is already taking place. So now when you look at this and you say, okay, we got 24 kids in here, you just can't move them from that room to another room because it, it's geometry to bio or whatever it may be. But when you do that and you move five kids, you may be creating an imbalance now for another period, another course. So we massage that out and the guidance counselors, when we get to that point, they go through individually schedules to see can we take a section of 24 and 15 and, and try to balance them a little bit? And there's times we can, and we, we do that. And there's times it's not feasible because it creates conflicts for kids and they don't get courses. So the point to that is when I talked about the number of classes or periods that are over that number, the, the, the massaging and the balancing and all that's already taken place in that master schedule. Um, to, to do it now, someone would have to either lose a course or, or or uh, you know, have a significant change that wouldn't be beneficial to the student at that point. Well, that said, we'll never not take a look, you know, if, if a situation arose. Um, but that work takes place through the spring and all summer long, so we have as few of kids as possible don't have a course um, with the school year. So with that, um, I don't know if you have any questions for me, uh, what that looks like, or about anything in particular. I have, I have a question, um, Mr. Mr. Defoe. What about lockers? It's like when it do, do the kids go to a locker between periods, and where are the lockers? So lockers are assigned by homeroom. Uh, you keep the same locker four years based on your homeroom, and lock, they are in the hallway. Um, So uh, to that point, we've not really used lockers this year. We've let kids, if they absolutely felt they needed to and wanted to, to use them, we've encouraged people not to. Um, you know, one of the things that we find is, you know, if you, if your freshman year, the ones that were available are back here in the 300 wing, that's as, probably as far out as it can be. And, and they don't use it quite as often. Uh, the other thing we've learned over time is, um, if, if you and I are, are friends and I have a locker in this corner and you have one in there, we, we kind of use each other's and I, what's convenient down there and I leave. But to, to that point this year, um, we strongly encourage not to use the lockers and don't have many kids at all using them. In fact, I don't, I don't, I mean, I'm sure there's some, but I don't see many. Um, but if they are, that will be one of those to the greatest extent possible situations where they're, they're going to arise. Mr. Tafoe, I have a question. Um, when we uh, sent the uh, elementary kids and the middle school kids back, we decided uh, the faculty and the staff needed like a two-week notice before we implemented that return. What kind of notice do you think the high school staff and faculty needs? I mean, obviously, as much lead time as possible would be great. The, the big component, um, you know, for us is with the dividers. Uh, we have the quotes, and, and Justin has that. Um, that's not something I'd run out and but I would run out and buy unless it became apparent we were absolutely going to use them. Um, so we've heard two to three weeks lead time on those. That stuff's ready to go. Um, but yeah, it's you know as much as possible. Obviously, it, to say Monday would be kind of rough. You know, so you know as much as possible. Like two three weeks would be great. How much are the dividers that you have quotes for? 
just looking for a general estimate because I know that we're looking at a budget shortfall issue and I'm trying to figure out what the long-term gain might be. So, so we've been in a process, I don't know if the, the official quotes, but I mean, from a magazine, you're talking $150 for a table or more. So the quote, the best quote we have so far is for the lunch dividers, $9,000 for 45 tables. The best quote so far for the um, dividers in the classrooms for the tables is $4,500. So $13,500 for both. So while we're talking about these dividers, you had mentioned that the band and chorus are changing rooms because of air exchange. And are, are you, do you have any numbers on what the time frame is? My understanding was that lunches are back to back to back. Do we know what the time frame is for the air exchanges? Doesn't the, I mean, to me, the dividers almost seem irrelevant if the air exchange isn't happening. So I'll take this one. The, the air exchange is part of the research related to music and singing and playing instruments in the woodwinds. So that's where that all came from because we do have kids singing. And so when you're, when you're doing that and you have this projectile, that's where they've said you need to, you need to uh, take care of that, which is a little bit different than eating. eating. And, and the lunches are 12 minutes apart on a regular scheduled day. So um, five lunch dismisses at 42 and seven lunch, the bell rings to start bringing them in at 51 or 52. No, 55, I'm sorry. Mr. Defoe, I just had one more question about the, the time frame. Is there a expiration date to the end of the school year? Like if, uh, is there a time limit? it's too late to come back if the students don't come back till April, May, is, is there a time limit to the end of the year? I, I mean, if that were the decision, I don't think there is, no. Um, and if it's, you know, even if it's a transition into the next year, if so I don't, I don't think there's any date that you'd say, no, it's not worth it. I mean, even if that were May, I don't think there's any such date um, that would say, no, we shouldn't, we shouldn't consider that. Um, so, yeah. And I, I guess, you know, part of that would be the, 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 the transmission rate numbers that were used as part of that, you know, if we moved from the substantial to the moderate, I mean, that could change at any time, so. Mr. Defoe, so one of the things I think about, you know, when we talk about, you, you mentioned the social gatherings in the lobby, hallways, what about the parking lot? Not that kids ever hang out in parking lots, but I know mine did. Yeah, it's, it's one of the challenges. I mean, without question, and there's a couple of students here. I, I spoke to every lunch shift a week ago, um, talked about, you know, the remote days if weather happened and went through the scenarios, um, talked about mask and, and said that, you know, the, there's a misconception that once you exit to the outdoors, you're free to take your mask off. And we'd certainly prefer till you got to your car. Um, obviously if you're going to a bus, it stays on, but the big component there is you need to make sure you're six feet apart. Um, and it's a, it's a daily process to keep people from gathering. And I mean, it, you know, it's, it's creatures of habit, you know, and, and that's, that's, it's just a constant daily, daily challenge to, to prevent that and keep it from happening. And it, and it does. Mr. Defoe, another question. Can you, uh, can you speak to the idea? I, I know a lot of parents I talk to are concerned, especially about their seniors. Can you talk about the impacts or possibility of probably bringing back just one or two of the grades and uh, whether that's possible and the impact of the feasibility of that? I mean, anything's possible. The, the challenge in a high school is there's very few grade specific courses, especially for seniors and juniors. So government is grade specific. Uh, but when you get to electives and all those other things, there's a mixture of nine through 12th grade. So you'd have a hybrid, you'd have 12th grade. In, I mean, you'd add a third tier to what that looks like um, as far as planning for teachers. So I, I think that would be extremely difficult, but anything's certainly possible. 
is that is that any more feasible than bringing all the students back? You is it once we get into bringing twelfth grade back? Would you prefer then the whole school, or would you entertain twelfth grade? I, I don't I don't personally wouldn't see a scenario that just one grade would be beneficial personally. I mean, other than for those kids and from that social aspect and that, but beyond, academically, I, I don't see that there'd be the, the benefit for just one grade to experience that now. And, and with that said, there might be a period or two in a day, but as over the course of a whole day and five days in a row now. Mr. Defoe, what impact would it have on, on sports, if any? I know a lot of our 45%, uh, I think, of our kids are athletes. I know we had a successful uh, fall sports season. Um, do you see that being as, as easy to do, you know, if we would go back full, or would it be even easier for people to get to sports practices and to do that? Do you see an impact on sports at all? I mean, for me to say anything in that regard would just be mere speculation and guessing. I, I mean, my, my, my overarching thought there would be, obviously, the more people that you have in an area, the more impact it would have if you have a positive, for sure, um, like I said earlier. So, um, you know, I mean, I, I will say there was county principals having conversations about athletes moving to remote because they were worried about that and worried, especially as it related to individual sports and individual postseasons. Um, not a fan of that, you know, I think that, that is a little out of priority and, and, but it's, it's, it is a world that we live in and, and different people prioritize um, so in, different things. So in those schools that you mentioned that are, um, full time back and they get one case and they put 40 or 60 kids in quarantine, that would include athletes that wouldn't be able to participate. Correct. If they're in a close contact, absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's. I mean, again, that it could be totally out of your control, but if 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 Corey and I are sitting in a class together and and that puts me in, it does it takes me out of everything, you know. I mean, it's got it's got Mr. Carlson nervous right now as they're trying to film a musical that the lead could be out at any time, you know. I mean, it, it's it's a distinct possibility. Um, you're seeing that at the collegiate and professional level organizations that have vast resources and every day you're seeing 10, 12, 15 competitions being postponed or canceled. And, um, you know, I mean, they're testing on a regular basis, but so yeah, they'd, they'd, they'd be out of anything that they're involved in. Mr. Defoe, um, do you, do you feel it would be beneficial to bring the kids back, say like two weeks prior to, like the beginning of the third marking period, say that way it would be like a transition period. You know, that would give them like a 10-day period before the end of the marking period. Then we would end up having Easter vacation, you know, the holiday there, which maybe that would have a calming effect. And then be right into the third marking period? Do you think that would be a, a transition? I mean, I, I think, honestly, I think it's beneficial whenever you feel it's safest, you know, and, um, you know, we originally talked about seeing how the other buildings, am I on? And we talked, you know, seeing how the other buildings, how that works and how they make out. The, the last day of the marking period is March or uh, March 26, I believe off the top of my head. The last snow makeup day is uh, actually in the fourth marking period. So conceptually, the last day could be that Monday, but I wouldn't see the need to move that. And then the four days would lead into the Easter. But, um, you know, I, 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 it, when it's safe, it's safe. And, you know, when it is, it is. You know, I don't know that there'd be a, there'd be a difference there. So one of the things I'm thinking, and I'm just going to kind of throw this out there, not sitting saying I'm – you know, the sole decision maker, but I really don't want the dividers to be the long pole in the tent. Frankly, Sorry. we probably should just go ahead and procure those and I, the, I can't hear the you. dividers. 
I don't want them to be the long pole in the tent, meaning that, you know, I, if it's going to take three weeks to get them in, I, and when we, you know, if we're ready to, when, when we're ready to make a decision, I don't want to wait three weeks necessarily. Uh, I don't, I'm not saying I want to do it next Monday, but I, I don't want to be waiting on a supply chain. Um, having been a little bit involved in that kind of business, sometimes the supply chains have been a little, let's say, a, they have a couple of weaklings these days. So I would, uh, I would recommend we get those sooner rather than later. That was a similar conversation that we had internally. We just, we actually, we got two quotes and we want to get another one, just shop it around a little bit. And um, Amanda, the, uh, we can use CARES funding. Yeah, we can use- That's what I was hoping we would use. That. Um, so, so yes, that, that is something that uh, we actually were waiting to get. We went out to the same companies to get the quote for the table dividers, thinking that package deal. We, so we just got those, I think, today. Um, so we are going to begin processing, trying to make a decision about what's best and then go forward. Is that something we need to approve then? Is that expenditure or no? And I, we may find ourselves in the same situation going into the fall and having to provide social distancing. And that would be something that we would reuse to possibly reopen it would help us figure out how to reopen. We would already have the supplies. So I will share um, just today's dashboard. Um, we had two cases come off. So we currently have zero positive cases that count towards the 14 day rolling average. We have eight quarantine elementary, two middle, four high school. I will tell you at the elementary school that we do have four positive cases that don't count against the building because we were in hybrid and the kids weren't in school. So that right now we have four positive uh, from the building. So that's the latest as of right now. And as I said, last meeting, um, we were talking about this meeting, you know, we had such a little time um, with kids in school and I really, uh, we, we've made lots of decisions looking at real time data and Mr. Defoe mentioned, um, the spike we saw, gosh, I have tried to put it on my mind, right after Thanksgiving, took about seven to 10 days, and then it just skyrocketed. And so my ask is, let us get to that until the next caucus meeting, which is Monday, March 8th. I think we'll have a better idea. And so right now you could say we're at zero. And so to me, we, we can't get any better than that. Um, so we're at zero and um, let's see where we are through this week, we got a couple, two days left this week, we have next week, and then we already have the caucus. Something that we've been, actually my colleagues, we, we superintendents in the IU, which are 26 school districts, York, Adams, Franklin County, we talk, we, we, we really have an understanding of what everybody's, what's happening. One of the questions that we've asked um, is um, related to, if you close your school because of cases for three to five days and clean, you reset the zero. So the question we posed, we weren't in school because of snow, okay? And so we've looked at weekends as an opportunity to maybe refresh. Here's the challenge that we run into. We still have people in the building, so we didn't close the building. Um, we still had uh, an athletic event on a Saturday, but it is an idea that many school districts are, are investigating because, you know, think if we don't have school on a Friday, you know, we've cleaned Thursday, we've cleaned Friday, we're off Saturday and Sunday. That's four days when kids haven't been in the building. In my mind, we should be able to reset. That's not the answer we're getting back yet. So we're still trying to push to get that answer. And to me, that, that would have a fairly significant impact if we had building refreshes based on that chart that says you've got to close when you get to so many cases. Like that's pretty significant. And so a lot of us are, there's only been one or two districts who've taken the risk on that. Many people are like, you take the risk, you know, we don't want to reset. And I got to be honest, one of the big questions that all of us have talked about is, is your community going to be okay with that? That all of a sudden you go back to zero? Like what caused you to go back to zero? So that's why I bring it up now. So we're still trying to get some clarification from PDE, Department of Health, because I think it's a legitimate question. And I would say, I'm, we're saying to them is, what would it take? Do we need to come in? And I know one district who's taken that risk is actually paying custodians to come in and clean on Saturday and Sunday. So that's how they're doing. And so is that what it would take? And then it comes down to, 
okay, what's it cost to do that? What's it cost to re, you know, you got to weigh the pros and cons of that. I just want, you know, like that's been an ongoing conversation for a while because well, one, it's winter and it's really hit us several times. And then sometimes you just have a Friday off for a holiday, you know, president's day weekend, we were supposed to have a big weekend. <laughs> that would have been a great reset time, but we had, in my mind, uh, we had teams in practicing on Saturday, teams in practicing on Sunday, the buildings weren't closed. And so stay tuned as I get, we kind of get clarity for that. I think that that could have some ramifications long-term. Okay. Mrs. I don't know if you want to entertain. Uh, no, public comment is closed. I'm sorry. I can't, if I open it for you, I have Dr. Hodges, I, I think I still have one more question for Mr. Defoe. Yeah, Mr. Defoe, can you, uh, we talked a little bit, of, you had a plan in there about the students that are identified that. Um, there was a, you had a, you had a slide in there about identifying students that had failed multiple courses and possibly bringing them back. I know you don't, I know there's a lot of details that would probably need to be worked out for that, but can you provide a, at least a little bit idea of what that looks like for the teachers, like how teachers will handle having some students there in class five days a week and other students that are still on the hybrid. And then what that looks like for the students where previously they were on a hybrid day, but now they're gonna be in school every day. Can you give us a little, little bit more details what you can about what that looks like? So, I mean, there's currently students that come five days now. So, um, you know, groups that, uh, students that were in those certain uh, identified populations come five days now. So from that standpoint, it, it wouldn't look any different. Um, the, the, the big thing is that, you know, some are very good at the self-motivation and responsibility and some of them, I mean, that's the thing, the theme we hear a lot of is it's not the work's not being completed. So they have that kind of on-site resource that would assist and, and, um, you know, encourage and, and push and, and, you know, kind of replace what's not, what they might not have in a different setting. So, um, that would be the, the big component to that. Um, you know, one of the challenges to that is, you know, is it a, is it a, uh, carrot to say, if you come off that list, now you can go back to a hybrid schedule or you should stay five days a week. And that's not a real, I don't see that being a successful process moving forward that I'm here five days for a week or two. And then I go back to two and so forth. So, um, you know, I, I threw that out as, um, you know, a possibility if, if, if it's not a full return, you know, we could, we could look at or consider that and that, you know, would, would be the group um, that, that would make the most sense because they're the ones that are, they're having the most difficulty in terms of academically. We do know, just I'll add to that, we do know of a few schools that are doing that. And I'd like to pick their brain. About. So one of the things that, that is a big difference, the students that are five days now are, it's our um, learning support and our ELL students. And all of those students have a different case manager other than a classroom teacher. So there is another build in support for those students. So if whatever's happening in the classroom, they have the ability to get pulled out to do something just a little bit different. That wouldn't be the luxury by, with, for all of the other students. So we would have to, um, think about what that would look like, the impact on a teacher. And I think, again, Mr. Defoe reaching out to those, those handful of schools who have talked about, some have implemented um, bringing more students back and this logistically, how, how have they done that? Has it been successful? Because I know it's just been recently. Um, and so I'd like to kind of touch base with them and talk with them and kind of learn from their experience. Well, not only that, but you have students who are doing well, you know, academically, they're maybe getting B's when they could be getting A's. And so, I mean, when I was in school, if I didn't get an A and I got a B, to me, that was failing. So I think we need to be sensitive to that as well when you just say, well, we're gonna bring in only the kids that are failing. And in my mind, that's, that's not entirely fair. I think the other, the other challenge that, to that is some of those students are learning support students and aren't, aren't choosing the option to come five days. Um, and conversations I've had with, with parents make a strong recommendation that your child return because the attendance and whatnot has become a significant problem. But in light of a pandemic and we've given options, it's difficult to say, 
I don't care how you personally feel about this or you don't feel safe and you must come back. So we've been very compassionate and fair in dealing with those. And it's difficult because you know it's probably not the best and it's not working, but um, you know, they tell you as, as someone shared earlier, they've lost family members to this and it's it's much it's significant to them because they've experienced it very close and, and firsthand. So you know, that, that's, that's been, you know, a, a challenge too. And I think to your point, it's difficult though, when you look at that in short term, you know what I mean? I don't know that that would, would necessarily be a positive. Like we'd, we'd want something that's a little further reaching. Dr. Hotchkiss, within your consortium or your IU um, of the three counties, do, are there any school districts that have high school back at a full-time rate and are any of them discussing that as an option? I'll talk to specifically, I'll, I'll address Adams County. No school district in Adams County has all high school students back five days. Uh, and in my recent conversation as of last week, nobody is currently planning to bring students back in Adams County. Um, across the IU, the high schools, the, the districts that have been back face-to-face -face started the year that way. Now, uh, Southwest was a new one. I, I didn't know that they were talking about that type, but to my knowledge, um, I don't know of another school district that after the attestation, after all of that in November, has voted to bring back everybody face-to-face -face in our IU. And that could be changing. I know some, uh, some have um, brought back hybrid who were fully uh, virtual. And I got to tell you, we're one of the few that has brought back some other students that was that was hybrid. Um, recently, the uh, um, Pennsylvania Department of Education, I don't know if you saw the news the other day, U.S. Department of Education talking about assessments, pushed out some information. And then the Pennsylvania Department of Education put together a letter and they're, and they're pushing it out. And uh, the latest the latest statistic that there are still over 30 percent of all school districts in Pennsylvania that are 100 percent virtual. Um, and, uh, they, what I, what we asked for is how many are hybrid, how many are back. We didn't get that data. We just got that hard number on the other end, but I can, I could just speak to IU. I do touch base with, uh, Cumberland County school district, those to our North, uh, no school district in Cumberland County has everybody back face to face. Our partners to the North do not. Um, but it is a conversation we're all talking about. We know our communities are doing the same thing. Like we're all just saying, hey, what, what, what are you thinking? What, what, what's the, the process? And there have been a couple school districts who've already committed saying the rest of the year we're going to go hybrid at the high school. Um, and so it's something every day as a board comes up and something comes up to talk. So I'm curious to see some of the other, other conversations. You know, but like I said, for me, um, we're just back K-8. You, you heard from the principals. I think it's been a good start logistically. And I'm fully 100% ready uh, on March 8th at the call community to give you the latest data. Our numbers are going to be the numbers. Um, we're going to be able to see the impact. And I think I've said that for a number of times in a number of meetings. Let's see the impact that that has. Because I will tell you, if you'd asked me on September 1st what I thought of school in September, I thought we'd all been closed at the end of September. That didn't happen. But I, I would have bet on it. it. It didn't happen. Now, coming out of Thanksgiving, we would have predicted that we were going to see a spike in numbers, and we did. Coming out of uh, the, the, the winter holiday, Christmas time, we saw a spike. And so I just want to see K to eight. Is there an impact? Are we seeing a, an increase in quarantines? Are we seeing any increase in positive cases? Like I said, fast, if we would have been back face to face a week, week and a half ago at the elementary, we would have had four cases that would have counted. So that's, that's my ask is it's seven more school days. That'll give us a 10 day look of K to eight being back. Um, and again, I, I, I'm saying this so I kind of remember, hey, how many students did we have? Because I, we update that Google slide with our dashboard daily. And so we can say on this, at this date, we are zero for positive cases. And so we'll see the, the real impact on those, uh, those numbers coming up. The other thing since our last meeting, um, CDC and uh, Pennsylvania Department of Health did come out finally and say that if you have the second vaccine and you're two weeks out from the second vaccine, for the next three months, you do not have to quarantine. So that's fairly significant. So you have to be two weeks removed from your second dose. And then they, they, right now they've given you a three month period. And so, like I told you, we have 70 or so people in the district that receive the vaccine. The second dose is coming up the end of this weekend. So that'll start to impact 
Um, but I tell you, we have a, a staff member we heard from today that uh, their spouse tested positive and they're, they got both doses of vaccine, but it hasn't been two weeks. So they will have to quarantine. And so it was kind of our first case to run through the timing of, of everything. Um, and so again, that'll, that'll play itself out as we get to the spring. So, you know, if you think of the district, you know, whatever percent 70 divided by you know, 315 or so, uh, whatever it is, the percent wise, um, in two weeks from Friday, that group of people, if there is an exposure, would not have to quarantine now in the district for the first time. So I think that's pretty significant as well. And doc Dr. Hodgkiss, I'm assuming you don't have any magic eight ball from the Department of Health about when we might be able to get our 1B teachers, the vaccine clinic that you were so successfully able to do for our 1A teachers. No, that... and so you, you all saw about the Moderna snafu uh, that happened. I can tell you that definitely impacted. I've been having back end conversations about future clinics that definitely was impacting in our area about the ability to offer something. And I do believe just today, if anybody wasn't the Johnson and Johnson just uh, approved today. And so the significance of that, they're, they're thinking of production middle of March, that's only one dose. And so that's, that's fairly significant. It'll be a third vaccine uh, that's out there. And so I do think that once that's produced, I think that that will, impact the one B capabilities. I'm hoping that's my magic eight ball. That's what at least what I see being positive is that uh, we're, we're going to see that. So, and they're, they're saying, I think today now, Mr. Biles, if you weren't, they say you were not in your head, weren't they saying by mid March that they'll be able to. Uh, I think they said mid March be produced, being able to ship yeah. out. And so, yeah, that, but yeah. let's be, let's be clear. Pennsylvania does not have a sterling track record <laughs> on getting them distributed. <laughs> so I really don't want to hang my hat on that. Good point. Um, so, Good point. I mean, WellSpent has been canceling people that were scheduled to get the vaccine this week because of the issue with the distribution that they had. So I will tell you, I am committed that, that I've worked, I'm working with a pharmacy. It's not a, it's not a big, um, it's not the, the, the WellSpan who will bring one B here I also volunteer to offer one for the community so that when we can roll out and other people in the community, I want to, I want to offer that here, be in, be in the hub to do that. So that's part of my, my plan, however long that takes. And whenever it is, I want to be a place that people can come to get it. Any other comments or questions? Okay. Are we ready to move to the um, middle school discussion? Yes, and so two things. Um, I'm going to have Mr. Peer every every Wednesday, every other Wednesday um, since the project, the new middle school project started. We have a construction meeting every morning um, where we get updates, and so we had one this morning. So Mr. Peer is going to give you an update um, of the progress at the current middle school, and then I'm going to show you some floor plans of conversations we've had with the old middle school and renovations and things that we're working on there. So Mr. Peart. Okay, um, so our fear was based on the last, I don't know, month, three weeks of snowstorms and all fun we, we've been dealing with was that uh, the report we were gonna hear today is how far behind they've, they've fallen and everything. But the, the good news is that did not occur. Um, we've received an updated 15 page schedule, uh, that ECI, the general contractor has provided, uh, that incorporates all four primes in it. Um, still showing that the substantial completion date matches the date of the original contract. So that is great news. Um, hopefully the bad weather is behind us um, and we see more days like today. Um, but even if we do, uh, they shared with us this morning that there's still built in days that can be absorbed. Um, it's not like they weren't doing anything uh, when the snowstorms and, and the freezing cold temperatures were occurring. Um, so they were able to move and do other work that wasn't necessary plan for that time of 
uh, in the schedule. Uh, so they were able to make up in other areas. But the good news is right now we are still on track and everything's looking good as far as a completion date. Um, some of the highlights uh, that, that you'll, you'll notice um, today, they actually, this morning when they pulled in, they were pouring the uh, slab over the, for the uh, media center, which is directly above the administration and main entrance. Um, and then the plan it has that all the second floor um, deck slab uh, concrete will be poured and finished by next week. Um, if you notice the wings on both of the building on both wings, the walls are the entire way up. Uh, they were able to continue up to that uh, even with the floor not being poured. Um, so what that enables them to do is after the pour is floored, uh, after the floor is poured, um, they will then put on the angle iron, uh, which then allows them to put the roof on. Um, so that is all going well uh, as planned. Um, the gym band course, that whole wing um, from Main Street towards 94 is 80% under roof. Uh, they currently are running temporary heat in there as you daily uh, for the HVAC work, for the plumbing work, and the electrical work. Uh, so there, the majority of that wing is really looking good. Um, the uh, the other interesting things that are positive is there's pre-installation of the cafeteria um, equipment occurs by the end of next month, the end of March. I'm not, now you're not going to see the things in there just yet, um, but uh, and the other part that I'll mention that I thought was a very positive is permanent power is going to be provided by the end of this month. Um, so when you pull in the morning and it's dark, you can see. I mean, it's it's you can probably see it from the space station. It's it's lit up that much. So um, it I for everything that the winter has provided them and for them to be because up to the point where we got a lot of snow, it's been great weather. Uh, they had no excuse not to be on track, but they've worked through it. And I, I mean, I'll just commend all the primes. They've worked very well together. All of our meetings, they're very cordial. They're very, I mean, I'm sure they have their issues that they handle, and, but it's been very smooth up to this point. So that's the update for now. Also on that um, schedule, as I, I look to the fall and I, I keep reminding them that we need to, we, we need to have the building where we need to move in, you know, trying to keep that out there um, to give you, for instance, we're, it's showing on the schedule by mid October that they'll be doing the final inspection of the cafeteria health inspection. I think that's pretty significant because we're not expecting the building until December. This main, the front that faces this way, that academic wing, they're showing that, that they'll be doing all of the final work on that by the end of October, beginning of November. Um, the middle, the main street, kind of the same time frame, And then the following wing on the back side is a little bit more mid-November. So that's all encouraging um, to see that. So for us, we are right in the middle of, we work through all of the furniture. So Justin and myself and Shannon, uh, we've met with the interiors and, and we're narrowing a, that down about what it would look like on the inside. And we already interviewed some vendors. So we'll be soon giving them that work, trying to get some of those quotes back. Um, so that, that, part is, uh, that part is moving forward. So it's, it's and if you look on the, the, when you go in the road and all of the white things covered up to the right, last week, Justin, three truckloads of the HVAC equipment, all of the HVAC equipment is on site already. Because of the lead times, we were very fearful of that. And so we're thankful that they're here. They're all sitting there waiting, which is a really good positive thing because that was the, you know, that unknown, are they going to get that? All of the steel is here. That's early on because of everything happening. Steel was a problem, but everything is here for that as well. So it's all, it's all good there. So also in that, I keep um, talking to our architect and saying, listen, we, here's my timeline for the old uh, middle school once we move. And so our goal is to move in over next Christmas break, this December, and then start in January, 2022 in the building. And so then we can start on the old middle school. 
And so I said, the timeline for me is by August of 2022, I need the facility there with the locker rooms and training room to be able to house people because that's the only facility we have to support the stadium. We have nothing else. And I said, I do not want to pay for trailers. I do not want to put anybody in a trailer. Like we need to get that done. So we're a year and a half out. And I said, that's my end, you know, begin with the end in mind. Um, that's where we need to be. And so let's back it up. And so we've had a, a lot of really good conversations about the space. And for me, it's been, this is the, the minimum that we need. And then we've looked at some other areas. The other thing that we're working on and that I'll, at some point I'll bring a presentation to you is some other districts have been very successful in running an auction when they're gonna tear down a building. And you open up an online auction and basically people go and you bid and you could come in if you wanna take you know, some of the, ca the ca cafeteria equipment, put a bid in, you come in, take it out and you can go. And so I know some districts have raised a lot of re revenue by doing that and that's definitely on my radar. So I wanna build that into the process as well. So what I'm gonna show you right now is a very high level conversation um, very high level ideas that we're, we're, we're working on, but I at least want to have you look at a few things here. Okay. So what you see here, <coughs> excuse me, is the floor plan of the building. Okay. It's the, the shade. And so to kind of orient you at the bottom is the front of the building. The green area on the left is what faces the stadium. Okay, and so that green area that you see there are where we have to put locker rooms, training room, all of the things that are in there now, um, we, that, that's a, that has to stay. And then the purple area, I'm gonna talk about, um, about some other options. And talking with lots of people, this is one theme that's that been, been a definite. They said, listen, look at your building because you have a building up. Once you tear it down, you've lost the space. So really put in your due diligence to think about some other uses. Also keeping in mind for me is we made a decision not to renovate that building for a reason. And so it's that fine line between, okay, this sounds great. How much will it cost to renovate this versus this? What I wanna show you here, this is <coughs> significant. And actually this uh, earlier today is the first time I actually saw definitively where this was. Because of previous renovations, where you see that red line that outlines like the gym, the, what are the locker rooms, the uh, auxiliary gym in the back, and then cutting across. That used to be the old exterior. And so the walls are fine for being an exterior. If you tear something else down, like no other wall, we'd have to do some things to make it an exterior wall. This already has it built in. And so that for me is the footprint that I'd like to look at for using the space, okay? So this is the green area. I tried to this will make sense to you just a little bit. I, I'm a stand up, need the point kind of guy. So this is the green area. So if you look on the bottom left, there's the bigger footprint. And so what we've done is we revamped that green space. So at the bottom is the visitor locker room. And so if you look over to the, all the way to the bottom left-hand corner, you'll see that, that that space doesn't look like what we're seeing here. We, we need to increase the size. We need to, we need to do a lot of things. Um, so we're, we're, we're planning to be able to house 55 to 60 people in the locker room. So that's what the visitor locker room area would be, where it would be. That bottom box is a, actually a current utility room. And so it's fortunate that it's in that area. We want to reuse that utility room. We want to reuse the things that are in there. As you travel to the north, you'll see the home locker room, which kind of, it basically, it takes up the old uh, locker room space and the hallway revamped you'll see there's a little toilet area. Then all the way to the north is the movement of the training room. And in that training room, it's a big open space, um, nice space. And then right in the corner is what I would say is like the coach's office. We, we pulled that out of the locker room. We just didn't want to have that in there. That could be for any adult. You could, you could do whatever you need to do in there. But this, this is, and, and along the, in the home locker room and the visitor locker room, those little boxes around the outside are the actual lockers that we can accommodate, okay? So this is the, represents the minimum that we would need to do to that building <coughs> to be able to support the stadium. We just don't have the facilities here in the high school. Now this area, it's the purple and the green area represents the, the this, what I just showed you, modified now, 
with the gymnasium. In the middle, what used to be the old locker rooms, we just talked about office space and the auxiliary gym. And so there are two things that I've been working on um, to try to, to bring up to a plan and, and they're still, I'm still working on them, but I did, um, my vision, two things. One, we need childcare in our community. It just really doesn't exist, particularly in the last 12 months. It's been, it's just gone by the wayside. And so I've spent some time investigating um, what it would take to open up um, our own daycare. Twofold, if the district operated it or if we had somebody else from the outside, we give them the space, they come in and they operate it because it is such a community need. And interestingly, right now, there's a lot of money out there for those type of programs, but we have to, um, we have to do some back end things that we're working on. But when I look at the, the gymnasium space, it's just this wide open space that could be made whatever you want. It's huge. There, there, there could be a, a definite purpose and need there. I also month, now it's probably been two months ago, I met with um, a company that we partnered with a while ago and talked about, hey, we have a building here. Would you have any interest? And so they expressed an interest in renting, leasing office space with their long-term vision of providing a therapeutic after-school program that was a business enterprise for them that really, that none of that exists in Northern Adams County, even in, in York County, um, even in Cumberland County, and possibly looking at this as a possibility to use. So I still have some of those ideas up in the air. And so what I, what I, where we're at with the architects, if you go back to, for me, I'll go back to here. It's, a, they have a meeting with the, um, our mechanical and engineering uh, consultant this week, this Friday, to kind of finalize some things. You know, what's the utility needs for the green space? We know we have to have. And then if we add the purple space, how much more in utilities would that add? And to me, it's that breaking point. I'll just, I'm gonna just exaggerate. If it's gonna cost us a million dollars more for utilities to add the purple space, I don't think we're gonna be able to get the return on that. I, I just wouldn't do that. But we're try, I wanna to try to find what the sweet spot is. What's the return? What do we have to invest? And I'll be honest with you, I would look to just keep the spaces for future use. Because again, once you tear it down, it's gone. And so I really care about the HVAC. Fortunately, we've had some We've used some different HVAC in our buildings, like even to our offices and some of the other smaller offices with different, more cost-effective ways. So we're investigating investigating that. So for me, we're getting this to a point that I wanna be able to bring you some more ideas, more details. Um, it's just a lot of moving parts. One of those could be, um, I'm looking at um, possible an expert and somebody as a consultant who has um, built daycares in a school district who's built them you know just from a business to try to guide us a little bit help me understand because i'll be honest, there's a lot of um rules facilities there, there just is a lot <coughs> i say that because i think that there are i just want to verify there are and then what are they and then oh by the way shane to renovate that space is going to cost you x amount because of all of these things you have to do like i just i want to i want to chase that down more and we're in the middle of that and so um, I'm excited that we're seeing this. So everything to the right would be the areas to be demolished. That's where we'd have the auction. People come in, they would be demolished. And part of our, our site work that was approved at the county and took a lot, this whole area on that side behind the middle school will all be redesigned and will be parking. You've been here to events. There's no parking. There, there just isn't like it's, so that area will be parking for anything that we have for the stadium. It's close enough. You can walk to any of the bill, except for the middle school, be a little bit of a hike now, but we've got great parking going in the new school. So I'm not worried about that. Like there's a lot, but for the supports for the high school and the elementary school, that's what that area is going to be. And so part of our, our plan is already to, to have that redesigned. Um, so that's the latest. Um, I'm, I'm anxious to hear, I'm really, one of our stresses is, is the utilities and what it would be uh, to maintain that. The other piece, some of these areas have a second floor. And so um, we don't, we don't want to rip it off because then you have to do a roof, but we also don't want to use it. So what does that look like? Um, otherwise we'd have to put in stairwells to be able to get up there and you get into all of that stuff. So we're trying to work through all of those details, but I want you to know that 
my energy is I'm as much as I've got one foot in down there, I've got half a foot in here now to kind of keep this going. And again, we have to, we'll have to go out to bid um, for this. We've already see, we already have the money from the bigger picture. We still have to go out to bid. Um, and so I just want to time it so that we have that opportunity in my mind that, that once we're out, we can hit go. We've got the auction lined up. Then we have a date lined up where we can actually start doing the renovation work because you know, like I said, we, we've got August 2022 and I, I want to be able to use part of that. So that's our latest. And Dr. The, Hotchkiss, just to be clear, we've already earmarked this money. This is already part of our new middle school correct, project. Yeah. It's, it's You're all, just expanding the vision of what is it actually going to yeah. look like? And like anything else, I'm going to come in under the budget. Like we've got money set aside for this. And my ultimate goal, I'm going to come in under. <clears throat> I also just want to share with you like, um, if you remember, you all approved the, the change orders from the original. So we're, we were about a million dollars underneath um, the, the budget for that building. Obviously, we're starting now and we get some change orders every now and again, cross our fingers. You, you heard last time about the um, propane, which is the biggest change order we were expecting. We're not naive that we're still going to get some change orders coming in. Um, I'm working on one now uh, with the auxiliary gym. Uh, an error and a mission for a map hoist. So we're working through logistics because we need to have that and we were missing some pieces and it's, so those are the little things that we're working through and keeping our fingers crossed that there's nothing significant. But to your question, we already have a budget. We already have the money there. And my, our ultimate goal is to come in under. Thank Other questions related to this. Thank you very much. And um, the board already knows that I'm very passionate about the lack of child care in the district. So I'm super excited um, about the possibility of exploring that as an option with that space. So one of the things that, that we definitely need to be, and, and I just, I don't know the parameters around it yet, is how much money is a nonprofit allowed to generate? So if we run it and we generate some revenue what are the rules behind that? How do we do that? And there are some school districts who have there. So we just, I just want to better understand that because I'll be honest with you, for me, if, if we can generate some revenue to offset some costs, why would we not do that year after year? That would be super. Um, and we stand to, to, to generate more if we run it, other than if we have to go out to somebody else to lease this space. But I, two things, like, let's try to reuse a building and let's try, I, I really, and to your point, care about providing a service to the community. We hear it, we know that, that childcare is an issue, actually for the community, for our staff. And I really think this, there's a lot of good that can come out. So I'm, I'm hopeful that that can come to fruition and we can see some, some good things come out of that. Thank you. Okay, any other questions, comments? All right, is there any other business to be brought before the board? Okay, if not, I'll call the meeting adjourned and we'll see everyone on March 8th at our next caucus meeting.